Good morning. I'm Rick Mitchell, Associate Pastor at St. Andrew, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to St. Andrew Baptist Church Online. Thank you for being intentional about joining us uh, for worship this morning. And if you're joining us uh, via Facebook, please comment uh, your name so that we can see that you're here. That'll be a big encouragement to all of us as we see who's worshiping with us this morning. I miss you. I miss talking with you. I miss shaking your hands. I miss giving and receiving hugs. You know, I will not take for granted the opportunity to gather with you in the future. I miss you. I love you, and I'm praying for you. In fact, in the comments below, you, we will provide easy instructions for you to share with us your prayer concerns and your needs. The request will go to your staff, and we'll pray with you, and we'll pray for you. Now, it's time to worship. I hope that you're looking forward to worshiping uh, this morning as much as I am. Let me tell you how you can maximize our time together. If you're multitasking right now, stop. Just make worship a priority. Put aside those other weighty things and uh, focus on worship. We'll sing together in a moment. So turn up your volume and sing loud and proud. Be expressive in your worship this morning and allowing God to receive the glory that He's due. When Brother Mike begins his talk, lean in. Allow the Spirit to speak through him to you. Listen and be expecting a message directed to you this morning. Take notes and then review them later today or tomorrow and take action on those things that will help you to become more like our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm excited for our time together this morning. Let's pray and we'll worship. Father, we adore you. There is no one like you. You're mighty in power, unsurpassed in glory and full of grace and mercy and love. Thank you for loving us. We confess that in times like these, we see just how dependent we are upon you for everything. Father, help us to lay our troubles at your feet and worship you in spirit and truth. Speak to us as we sing and as we hear your word taught in a few moments. Do a mighty work in your people today. Help us in our isolation to feel connected to you and to one another. Heal our land of this virus and bring us back together we, uh, to worship you soon together. We've come to praise you and to worship you and to give you honor and praise and glory for there is no one like our God. And all God's people said, Amen. Let's worship. Thank you. 
as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Sing with us as we praise Jesus, our living hope. Desperation, I try. 
promise, your buried body began to ring. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim. Hello, church. We are so glad that you are here with us this morning. Yes, we understand that this is not ideal, but this is what we have. And we're going to use the technologies and uh, the things that God has given us in the best way we can. So we do have some good news in the midst of everything that's going on. Um, we have seen uh, the large scale production of the gospel going out through digital services uh, just on our church Facebook page alone. Uh, last week's service, we had 1,958 views just on our church service alone. Uh, so in, in a way, we see that there's this digital revival going on, so much so that even Facebook and other streaming services uh, started to lag last Sunday with everyone who was online. So in, in a way, the, the church almost broke the internet. Uh, so it's, it's pretty amazing to see. We see the church stepping up to get the gospel out there. And here at St. Andrew Baptist Church, it's no different. We are still working and finding new ways to connect with you and to get the gospel out to many people. We are still here handing out food every day to our community and those people who are in need. And so as we prepare to give this morning, we do so with confidence confidence that we know that God is using this opportunity, using this season to see his word spread. And so on the screen below, you're going to see some opportunities and some ways that you can also give to the work that's going on here. And so we give because it's an act of worship. We give because we're happy to give. And we give because it shows that this world is not our home and a place that we want to store our treasure up at. So thank you for giving this morning. What you do matters. Let us pray. God, we love you. And we are asking for a miracle, a miracle in our world, God, that this virus would cease, that it would stop. We ask this, God, in your name, because we know that you're the only one who can do this. And so, God, we pray that in the midst of this season that we trust you, that we know that your gospel is being spread in a different way, in a, in, in a different time. Uh, but God, we know that, God, that you are doing this for our good and your glory. So glorify yourself this morning. As we prepare to give, as we have opportunities to give in different ways, may we take advantage of that, Lord, to show, to prove that, God, we want to be good stewards of what you have given us. So God, as we give, plus the gift and the giver. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still. Hezekiah of Judah was fruit that fell from a rotten tree. His father, King Ahaz, had promoted the worship of every pagan god of the Middle East 
in the land of Israel. He himself had offered his firstborn son and others of his children as burnt offerings to the Canaanite god Molech. Because Ahaz refused to trust in the Lord God of Israel for the protection of his family and his people, he sought to make a treaty with the growing empire of Assyria. He went to their capital in Nineveh, and there he was entertained and shown all the marvelous worldly sights of the city. There he saw an ornate pagan altar built in honor of the false gods of the world. He was so taken by the appearance of this altar that he had the design copied and brought back and enlisted his craftsmen to attempt to duplicate it there in the city of Jerusalem. When the altar was built, Ahaz set aside the altar of sacrifice that God had had placed in front of the temple and put in place this altar of the pagan God. But Hezekiah, the oldest of Ahaz's son to escape his father's wickedness and live, was delivered by the Lord from this treachery and betrayal of the Lord his God. How it was that the Lord rescued Hezekiah from the perverse genetics and environment of 8th century B.C. there in the land of Judah, we do not know. Perhaps it was from the influence of his mother or maybe his grandmother who truly loved the Lord and who taught this to Hezekiah. But Hezekiah was rescued by God and became a man who loved the Lord with all of his heart. In fact, 2 Kings chapter 18 and verse 3 says, And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father had done. And in fact, if you have your Bible there nearby you, as you are listening to this message, you might want to open it up to 2 Kings chapter 18 and 19 and just follow along while you'll be able to see the verses that I'm quoting particularly as I bring this message to you. If you have your Bible, you'll be able to follow along in the context. But Hezekiah was a man that God delivered to follow him. And in fact, in verse 5, it goes on to say of Hezekiah, he trusted in the Lord God of Israel. And after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor who were before him. That means that of all the kings that ruled over the nation of Judah, Hezekiah was the one who loved and followed the Lord the most. In the early years of Hezekiah's reign over the land of Judah, he destroyed that pagan altar that his father had built in place of the altar of sacrifice. He released the people to go and to destroy the false altars of pagan gods that his father had allowed to be built literally on every hill of Judah and under every green oak tree. Hezekiah reinstituted the sacrifices and the worship of Yahweh God in the temple and he brought back the practice of the Passover under the influence of Wicked kings, the celebration of the Passover in Israel had not been done for many, many years. But Hezekiah led the nation in revival. And he led them all to celebrate the Passover, which was a celebration of God's deliverance of the nation of Israel from their bondage to Egypt. And thus the scripture says of King Hezekiah in verse 6 of chapter 18, for he held fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but he kept his commandments, which the Lord had commanded Moses. And so Hezekiah was a man who feasted on the faithfulness of God. Hezekiah practiced Psalm 37, like we talked about last 
Sunday. First, he delighted himself in the Lord, which means that Hezekiah was a man who praised God for who he was. And then Hezekiah committed himself, committed his way to the Lord and followed God in all that the Lord told him to do. And Hezekiah was a man that, though, as we will see, faced great challenges and problems, was a man who did not give himself to fretting. He refused to worry and he refused to be stirred to anger. But instead, he rested in the Lord, choosing to wait patiently upon God and to put his trust in him. The thing about Hezekiah that we want to make special note of this morning is that Hezekiah did all of these things through prayer. And so the Bible says in chapter 18 verse 7, the Lord was with him and he prospered wherever he went. God was with Hezekiah for he was a man who feasted on the faithfulness of God who trusted in him and who rested and waited upon him. And then that verse adds one of the most significant things that happened in the life of Hezekiah. It says, and Hezekiah rebelled against the king of Assyria and did not serve him. While his father had sought a treaty with Assyria to protect himself and his nation. Hezekiah said, we will no longer be a vassal state ruled by an empire who refuses to acknowledge the one true God, the creator God who made all that there is in the world. He said, we will obey the Lord. We will trust in God. He is the one that we will serve. Hezekiah's decision was quickly followed by two important actions. First of all, Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, came calling at the gates of Jerusalem with all of his mighty army. But secondly, Hezekiah, the king of Judah, fell on his knees before the God of heaven. And by means of his prayers, Hezekiah once again experienced the faithfulness of God. Sennacherib, with his army camped outside the gates of Jerusalem, sent a letter to Hezekiah. It said, Do not let your God in whom you trust deceive you saying, Jerusalem shall not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Look, you have heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all the lands by utterly destroying them. And you shall be delivered. Have the gods of the nations delivered those whom my fathers have destroyed? Gozan and Haran and Rezeph, and the people of Eden who were in Talassar. When Hezekiah received that letter, he read it, and he said, I'm giving this to God. And then King Hezekiah marched straight up to the house of God, and he laid the letters down upon the floor. And then he fell on his knees and he prayed. He said, oh Lord God of Israel, the one who dwells between the cherubim, you are God. You alone, you alone are God of all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Now incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see, and hear the words of Sennacherib, 
which he has sent to reproach the living God. Truly, Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste the nations and their lands and have cast their gods into the fire, for they were not gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore they destroyed them. But now, therefore, O Lord our God, I pray, save us from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you are the Lord our God. You alone. Folks, sometimes... For us to experience the faithfulness of God, we have to take the things that are threatening us and give them to God, as Hezekiah did. Right now, all over the world, <laughs> right here in Bay County, people are panicking, panicking because of the coronavirus. And so for $1,000, you can buy one of these. And you can wear it all day long. Well, at least in this, you won't be able to touch your face. And while we all need to follow the reasonable precautions recommended by our leaders and by the CDC, folks, we need to be giving this crisis to God. We need to be falling upon our knees before the Almighty and calling upon the one who has always been faithful for him to pour out healing, for him to grant protection, for him to bring recovery to each of us individually, to our families, to our nation, and to the world which has been made by his all-powerful hands. You know, James reminded us in chapter 4 of his letter. He said, you have not because you ask not. Folks, we need to give this to the Lord through prayer. May I remind you, prayer is not a mere exercise in positive thinking. Prayer is not just a realignment of one, a person's own attitude. Prayer is calling upon the creator of the universe, conversing with him, asking for his help and for his intercession. Prayer invokes the mighty power of God. All of us remember Hurricane Michael. Many of you gathered here will remember when we gathered the first Sunday after the storm out on our north parking lot. And as we were preparing to pray, I ask you to join me in praying specifically that God would give us a large tent because we were going to begin ministering to our community. And we knew that God was going to supply the needs of the people all around us. And we needed a tent in which to keep those goods. And in which to be able to distribute those things that were needed to the people all around us. We knew no source of the tent. We did not know who to ask. Not that we were able to call anyone anyway. But we knew that God had the resource available. And so that day, standing out there on the parking lot, we prayed for God to get us a tent. Two days later, the tent showed up. We did not discover who owned the tent or who loaned us the tent until we were in the process of taking it down. But we knew that God had sent us that tent to use to minister to the community. Interestingly, I had had a very similar experience back in Slidell, Louisiana, where 
my wife and I were living and, and pastoring in a church there in that community when Hurricane Katrina hit. We had one tent that had been quickly loaned to us by our Louisiana Baptist Convention and we had filled it up with food and cleaning supplies. But Katrina was different from Michael in that the flood waters had entered everyone's home and most people had almost all of their clothes completely ruined by the, the foul-smelling mud that was brought into their, their residences. And so we needed a second tent to hold tons of clothing that was being donated for the people of the community. When I realized this need, I said to one of my fellow ministers, I don't know where in the world we might be able to find another tent. By this time, every tent in the state, every tent in the region will already be committed to the various places that are doing disaster relief. I don't even know who to call. I don't know who to ask. And about that time, my cell phone rang. I answered and a man said, we're from Texas and we are in the business of making tents. If you happen to need a large tent, we've just finished one that we could bring to your property and set up. And I said, oh, that would be marvelous if you would loan us a tent like that. We need it right now. And he said back to me on the phone, he said, oh, no, we don't want it back. We are giving it to you to use for the kingdom of God. Time after time, I experienced the hand of God in response to, to prayer bringing us the need, the things that we needed, not merely for ourselves, for our church, but for all of the community. I can remember that as we were trying to clean out our own church to make a space for people to come and to be able to sleep there and go out in the community and to clean up houses, that we had stacked all the debris right outside the building. As we cleaned it out, we just just stacked it up right outside the building so that it made literally a ring around the entire plant. All we had was a small little bobcat that would just move a little scoop at a time. I was talking to the man that had been operating the bobcat all day long trying to move some of the debris away from the building because it was beginning to attract both rats and snakes. And I sat down on the a shovel of his bobcat. And I said, you know what we need is one of those great big tractors with a front loading shovel on the, the front end so we can move all of this quickly out to the back of the property. And about that time, my cell phone rang. And I answered the phone and the brother said, Brother Mike, we're a crew from Minnesota. We've been down to your church once. And we're fixing to head back to try and help the church and help the community some more. He said, and we own some big equipment. Could you use a front-end loader? And I said, we were just talking about that. We were just asking the Lord to make that available. And yes, he said, we'll be down in three days. While they were there for the next week, they moved every bit of debris that was around our truck out to the, the back where later we were able to dispose of it. I'll tell you, prayer invokes the mighty power of the living God. And that's what Hezekiah did. A massive army that the men of Israel could have never repelled sat in front of the gates of his city. But Hezekiah gave the problem to the Lord. And he called upon God in prayer. Now we do not know how long Hezekiah waited in faith for God to answer that prayer. We don't know how many times Hezekiah went back to the Lord and repeated his petition before God sent his answer. But in the time that was right, 
the salvation of the Lord came. And 2 Kings chapter 19 verse 35 says this. And it came to pass on a certain night that the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000. And when people arose early in the morning, there were the corpses all dead. And then the scripture adds this, almost as a footnote, in verse 36 and 37. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went away, returned home, and remained at Nineveh. Now it came to pass, as he was worshiping in the temple of Nisroch, his god, that his sons struck him down with the sword. Folks, God is faithful to answer prayer. Nothing is too big. Nothing is too hard. We can take anything to the Lord our God. We can take this crisis right now that surrounds our entire globe and we can take it to God and he can handle it. The angel said to Mary, for with God nothing shall be impossible. God's faithfulness to answer prayer is one of the rewards that God gives to the righteous. You may be saying, now wait a minute, Brother Mike. We're not, we're not saved by our righteousness and you are so right. The scripture says, for by grace we are saved through faith and that not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works. So no one is able to boast. But we're not talking here about salvation that comes by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But we are talking about how God rewards righteous living and righteous deeds among those who have come to faith in Jesus Christ. A few weeks ago, we talked about God's rewards that will be given to the saved at the judgment seat of Christ. But folks, God also rewards his people through the answering of prayer. Listen to the Holy Spirit as he writes through the wise man in Proverbs 15, 29. The Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. And James said in chapter 5, verse 16, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And Peter said in his first letter in chapter 3, verse 12, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. God rewards the prayers of the righteous by hearing them and answering them. My friend, I tell you, in this time when all of us are a part of the crisis that rests upon our country and upon the world, there are two particular things that we need to do. One is that we need to make certain, as the scripture says, of our salvation. That we have come to the place where we have believed in our heart that Jesus, the Son of the living God, left heaven and came down to this earth and allowed himself to be crucified on a cross where he paid the penalty for our sin once and for all. The Bible says that all of us have sinned. All of us fall, fall short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. And Jesus, knowing that our sin separates us from God the Father, 
came and paid the penalty by dying for those sins upon the cross. And so the scripture says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So we begin by believing in our heart, believing that Jesus died for us and that he rose from the dead. But then secondly, we must confess with our mouth. That means that we must declare that Jesus is our Lord. And when I say that Jesus is my Lord, I am saying that one day there came a time that because I believed in Jesus that he died for me and rose from the dead, I made the choice to invite Jesus to come into my life and declare, Jesus, I want to follow you. I want to obey you. I want you to be the Lord. Lord means master. I want you to be the master of my life. And the Bible says when you do that, when you believe in your heart that Jesus died for you and rose from the dead, and you invite Jesus to become the Lord of your life, you will be saved. And I'll tell you, these are not days in which a person ought to be insecure about their salvation, where they say, maybe I am, I hope I am. It's a day to be certain that you have put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ. But for all of us who have done that, for all of you who do that even today, put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ. The second thing that we should remember is that this is a day for prayer. This is a day that we, like Hezekiah, should draw upon the faithfulness of God through prayer. And we need to take the things that we're facing, not just the threat of the coronavirus in a general sense, but the particular things with which we are wrestling as a result of that. We need to take that and give that to the Lord. We need to lay it before the Lord just as Hezekiah did and put our trust and our faith, our confidence in him as we lift it up in prayer. And I'm wondering right now, whether you might be willing to just join with me, even as you watch this service, would you join with me in praying, much like Hezekiah prayed, where we will pray and we will feast on the faithfulness of God. I'm going to ask you, wherever you are, in your living room, in your car, if you're outside, maybe watching with a, a friend, wherever you are, would you just bow your head, would you just close your eyes before the Lord so that there's, there's no distractions around where you could just enter into a conversation with God? And I'm going to ask you, first of all, just to join with me in delighting yourself in the Lord. What that means is just to think upon all the good and wonderful things you know about God. And rejoice in those things. And to praise him for being all of that. You know you could express this silently just in your heart. And the Lord will hear you. Or you can say it aloud. If you're by yourself just say it aloud. If there's two or three of you. Each of you could, could speak one thing and then another. But just Delight yourself in praising the Lord. Just, just say like Isaiah did. Lord God, you're the one who made the heavens and the earth. Lord, you're the one who is Lord over all the countries of the globe. God, you alone made everything that there is. And we can add that which we learn about God, especially through our Lord Jesus Christ. And say to him, God, you are all loving. And you are merciful. And God, you are kind. God, you are good. Just delight yourself in all the good things of the Lord. Would you do that? And then commit your way to the Lord. Say, Lord Jesus, I trust you. Lord, I, I trust you in the midst of this crisis that we're going through.
But Lord, I trust you with all of my life. Jesus, I want to follow you. Jesus, I want to obey you as my Lord and my Master. And Father, I desire to obey your Word. I want to obey your Word, what it tells me to do today, what it tells me to do every day. And then say to the Lord, I will not fret. That means I I will not allow worry or irritation to ignite my anger, to make me glow and burn hot with anger. Instead, I will trust in you, Lord. And I will rest in the Lord. I will rest in the Lord and I will wait patiently upon him. Concerning the crisis we're in now, but concerning all the problems and the difficulties that I am facing. And Lord, I will bring them in prayer to you and will trust in you. Now let me just conclude our prayer together. Lord, in faith, we are coming together to you. Lord, first and foremost, to offer to you our worship. For you alone are God. You alone are worthy of our worship. And so we praise and exalt and glorify you. Grateful that all power in heaven and earth belongs to you, Lord Jesus. And grateful that you are good and kind, and full of grace. Lord, we also come making expressions of our trust. For Lord, we declare that our confidence is in you. Our hope is in you. And we trust in you. And Lord, we come to you pleading for your help. Because, Lord, the things that we are facing are too big for us. But we declare they are not too big for you. And, Lord, as we have seen your deliverance in days gone by, we ask for your deliverance again. Because of your goodness and because of your grace. And, Father, we pray for your help in these difficult times. Lord, we believe. Lord, we know in our hearts nothing is impossible for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.